Hello, this is William Goldsmith from Sunny Day Real Estate, <laughs> formerly and presently Assertion. Welcome to the next chapter of As the Story Grows. I'm Brian Patton. This week, I'm so excited to have William Goldsmith join the podcast. Will has a new band, Assertion, and they're releasing their debut record, Intermission, this Friday, April 9th on Spartan Records. Will chats about growing up and his love for the Beatles, the formation of Sunny Day Real Estate, Emo, and how his children have inspired his new band. I want to give a shout out to Stephen Osicki for putting the show on William's radar and to John Frazier at Spartan Records for making this episode happen. It was great getting to chat with Will, and I hope you guys enjoy it. I'm doing pretty good. Um, yeah, just uh, we just gave my son a haircut, so Fun. he's pretty happy about that. He's That's very, awesome. yeah, when his hair looks kind of styled out, he's very, very, he's kind of into it. I don't know why. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, but it's I fun. feel that. I feel that. Yeah. Yeah. I relate. I relate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, how, many, how many kids do you have? Yeah. Two. Two. two? Yeah. yeah wow. Yes. Six and four. Wow. Yeah. Twelve five going to be six tomorrow oh, Logan, and then awesome. and then and three so oh, yeah. three years old right in it right in it uh-huh <laughs> that's awesome yeah cool, that's awesome. cool. well cool, thanks man. for having me on yeah thanks for doing this uh i love the two tracks the assertion tracks that uh spartan has premiered so far i'm looking forward to that record it, it sounds amazing gotten, i'm sorry i should have gotten you the full record ahead of time oh it's okay it's all good sorry about that gave me opportunity to listen to your back catalog spent a lot of time listening to fire theft because that record's so amazing um yeah we i mean i'm not saying yeah it's amazing but <laughs> i'm saying uh we um uh, we with that record we had kind of a we had a bit of a vision we wanted yeah. it to be like an experience and for i think what we were tr wanting to do it slightly felt short but i don't know if we really even understood completely what what we were shooting for as well. Yeah. So yeah. Well, we're already uh, talking about that record. So let me let me ask when you guys did the fire theft, was there you said you had a vision. Was there something you wanted to do creatively different than Sunny Day, since it was you, Jeremy, and Nate? No. Um, no, like for for us it, the vision was more like have it be an actual experience. But then as far as musically, it's always been about just having whatever comes out at that particular point in time yeah let that just be what it is because that way you're sort of getting more of an authentic sort of documentation of the human beings at that point in time so gotcha yeah. what, was, what was the driver to make that its own separate project as apart from like the next sunny day record um we we just sort of so sunny day had signed us time bomb records mm -hmm. and then and right when we got done making the rising tide record they were a subsidiary of uh arista arista dropped them mm -hmm. and so the record kind of the label sort of kind of just sort of stopped existing and then the the uh arista basically owned the record and they didn't even want to talk to us they just had no you know oh, it just sort of existed but i mean we i we've never We've never spoken to anyone there, never nothing. Just, <laughs> yeah, we were just kind of it was put out there into the world, but um and 
so there was frustrations uh around that and um we just decided to originally we were thinking about trying to make a record try to pay for it ourselves and release it ourselves but we ended up doing through doing it through Ryko disc um, okay. and i can't for the life of me figure out why we did that <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but uh so yeah it was just kind of some frustration around that and um you know and it originally was just jeremy and i gotcha. and then and then nate kind of just started popping you know showed up and coming around and so we we're like want to play bass on the record and he was like sure so it was like a that's last minute kind of a thing oh cool yeah that's awesome yeah that's awesome let's let's go back uh you grow grew up in the seattle area is that where you're from originally yeah i was born in seattle but grew up in kirkland okay cool. what got you into music uh being surrounded by you know a bunch of olders and brothers and sisters yeah being a kid and being the youngest of nine kids and you know constantly just hearing music all the time they're always playing records so that's kind of what really got it started off oh, and that's uh, cool. yeah and uh uh that and my brother played drums a little bit so we had a kit and i'd always kind of just look at it <laughs> <laughs> and was fascinated by it i became hyper obsessed with the beatles when i was yeah. five six years old like for some reason you know like really just super super into the beatles yeah. like you know kind of was buying into the <laughs> you know the uh the myth of ringo being the greatest drummer in the world <laughs> kind of, like i was experiencing beatlemania at five years old in like 1979 <laughs> so and um but uh and uh and you know i would play beatles at recess yeah that's what i did later on you know like we would go outside and i would want to pretend that we were the beatles just kind of walking around <laughs> so, that's so funny yeah pretty funny but uh yeah but i always i wanted to be but i for sorry i want i didn't want to always be the one playing ringo i always kind of wanted to be like if john lennon was the drummer i kind of wanted to somehow <laughs> be that but yeah but yeah. uh that and uh you know and the weirder thing i had like an imaginary friend that was a drummer you know but no, obviously stemmed from my brother playing drums yeah. and all that you know so so I'm not saying it was real i'm saying it was a kid <laughs> so uh but yeah that pretty much is what really got got me started uh, as far as being interested and in why i gravitated towards drums i mean aside from you know there being a drum kid in the yeah. house maybe but i mean and then i i we my brother my other brother had loaned out my other brother's drum kit <laughs> to some people and they never returned it oh, no. and yeah they just kind of faded away in the background wasn't you know wasn't really my business i didn't push it so so it, was, it, it sucked because then i had to basically ask for a drum kit from you know that point on all the way until i was 13 when i finally got one so oh man yeah so thir 13 that's when you really started playing yeah um they gave me a snare drum when i was in fifth grade i was like this is great but then there's this other stuff that goes <laughs> that you have to <clears throat> that you kind of need to you know yeah. do the whole thing that i wanted to do but but you know and you know i tried um i played like in the grade school marching band which was literally not really a, you know i mean it was just that 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 you know stuff <laughs> so but i wish that i would have like had more experience in drum corps and stuff and actually if i would have actually like gotten training and learned how yeah. to play it would have been an interesting interesting to see what would have been different but oh well yeah <laughs> you know, what do you do <clears throat> yeah i was a guitar player and my brother had a drum kit he took lessons and i was just like watching metallica videos and was like i can do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah. So yeah he's trained and i was like i can do it <laughs> yeah 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 uh, yeah no i yeah i don't i i did the same thing although i i would watch a lot of footage of keith moon yeah. i never said i never felt like i could do it but i was like i want to try to do that and yeah. I was like, I'm gonna see if I could do it. So, you know, so I would listen to early on, it was like I listened to a lot of, you know, 2112 Rush and Permanent Wave, stuff like that. The Who, Quadrophenia, especially a lot of Led Zeppelin. And it was those three drummers that I kind of really looked to looked to for sort of like guidance or how to learn. 
pretty much for my foot. I was paid a lot of attention to John Bottom. That's so, cool. That's you know. cool. Yeah. That's awesome. That translates not in the way you play, but I think in how you hit, like you hit really hard, at least in those early days, you, you hit really hard. Yeah. I, I, yeah. No, I still do now. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, that's just, it's just kind of the way I, the way I, I play. I, I think I, I, I kind of changed my approach. I had to learn how to relax a little bit more. I used to play very, I would be very tense, you know, mm -hmm. and alive, especially I had such um, stage fright that I would, the live performances a lot of times were almost like panic attacks. Oh man. And uh, so, yeah, that's, you know, so I was always kind of like, not quite exactly where, you know, I was performing slightly below my, what I should have been mainly just because of nerves, but, um, yeah. but I eventually had to learn how to um, breathe. Mm -hmm. as weird as that sounds i would not i would not breathe while i was playing i was oh, very man. tense i would just i would hold my breath and then i would you know and then yeah. take a breath in and i had to learn how to sort of regulate my breathing and relax and learned i could actually hit harder yeah and not you know and not uh, choke the drum as much and get a better tone if i was a little bit more relaxed so try i've been still trying to find a balance with that but that's cool i got i got better yeah at that yeah and That's some awesome. and some injuries i mean i literally i my body was destroyed so i mean i literally had to change my approach if yeah. i wanted to keep doing it so yeah yeah so, so did yeah you, did you have back issues no, no primarily my yeah. issues were my hands constantly going dead no feeling okay. in my hands like oh, and, you know kind of like if you fall asleep on your arm yeah. but that but you're just hanging around you know oh, during man. the day yeah and there isn't anything you can and it's not like you can get off your arms so that yeah. you know the feeling comes back it's like it's kind of panicky and then i my shoulders i felt like i had um it felt like i had knives in my shoulders that's what oh. i felt like oh, and right. i couldn't lift my arms past this point like literally past my elbow like here i wouldn't oh. be able to go like that so so yeah so i had to do a bunch of stuff change my diet and stop drinking and stop you know being yeah. self self-destructive and yeah <laughs> and then learning learning how to breathe and and uh and relax more so yeah yeah so it was nece necessity pretty much but yeah. i still hit hard i think that's yeah. justin I think okay I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's cool yeah i only asked about back because i have like three drummer friends and in like a year they all had like back <laughs> surgeries it was wild oh my yeah. god yeah wow it was crazy yeah yeah um if you ever if you if any of your any drummer friends of you are having any issues tell them to research something called rolfing r-o-l-f-i-n-g that's another thing that i did i okay. i was rolfed for eight uh for three years straight and uh they basically break down your muscle tissue and then uh it rebuilds itself and set gets set back to what it was kind of originally before you screwed it up oh, man. so it's really cool that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. When you got your drum kit at 13, did you dive right into playing in bands? Yeah, no, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I uh Yeah, I got it on Christmas Eve. They get uh they gave it to me and then that Christmas Eve I I set it up immediately and sat down and started playing and that's what I I I spent a lot of time there from that point on, but then, you know, after the break, went to school and I was like, I have some drums, I need a band. So I just grabbed my two closest friends and I was like, hey, you know, we need to start a band. So one had like a little keyboard thing and then we had got like a PV amp and we had like a little cheap Radio Shack microphone thing or whatever and ran that through there. And and uh, and yeah, it was, I was obviously just terrible, but you know, you had to start yeah. somewhere. And then um, when I got to high school, um, we tried to continue that <laughs> because they also went to the same high school with me. So, um, and I met a guy named John Atkins, um, who, uh, has had a, a bunch of bands, uh, Hush Harbor, seven, six, four hero, um, magic magicians. Um, but he actually could play bass. Like he really, really could play bass. He was a really great bass player. Yeah. And I was, for me, it felt like I was meeting like, uh, ironically, a magician, <laughs> I was like, wow, like a wizard I was like, wow this is amazing so he came over 
And then we tried doing the same band thing, but with him playing bass. And then John and I kind of realized that maybe we should just break off from everybody else. Yeah. And uh, so we started a band called The 13 and he played guitar and sang in that and I played drums. So, and it was cool. And that's where I had my first experiences with actually like working on arranging and creating songs with someone. It was really cool. It's a really great, very, very fun time. Very uh, good memory as far as as that stuff is concerned. Nice. That was the moment you were like, I want to be in bands. This is what I want to do. Oh, I mean, I knew that when I was fifth, when I was five. When you were five, yeah. When I was five years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew that what I wanted to do is I want to be in a band. That's awesome. And yeah, so, so yeah, I essentially, yeah, I wanted to be a Beatle, you know, or just in a band, you know, like where you're creating this thing where everybody's doing it together and you know whatever the the saying is the uh, whole is greater than the sum of its parts right yeah, yeah. yeah um you know so uh yeah that was where that was pretty much where i learned how to actually like have that kind of collaborative interaction with someone so yeah, yeah. and john john atkins is is a genius he really is so cool. great songwriter what was the uh, evolution through bands that got to Sunny Day? Um, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the condensed version. No, no, I'll, like... <laughs> I'll try. You're talking to someone who has a tendency to over-explain things, so I'll do my best to not. Um, so, uh, so it actually, really, it goes from that band, The 13. I met Jeremy Enoch when he was he was 14 when i met him and i was 16 and we ended up over at my house and john uh who i was in the the 13 with he actually had a little uh bass amp in a in his bass and it was actually still at my folks's place so jeremy picked that thing up and we actually you know, sat down and played a little bit. And I was like, wow, there's another, here's someone else actually who can, who can actually kind of pick up something and competently, you know, comp- make music with it. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, I had an idea to have him come and play bass for, uh, John and I, so he showed up, but he showed up with his guitar and his amp and, uh, immediately started playing those. So John politely picked up his bass was playing that and uh we played we played we played a lot of u2 covers he wanted to play a lot of u2 (laughs) he was really into u2 and um you know that got a little annoying after a while (laughs) but but i was always impressed with the fact that this 14 year old kid could sound like bono and the edge all in like one person (laughs) like pretty pretty much and i was like well that's something so but we needed a bass player so we just kind of said cool man it was awesome hanging out so <laughs> then uh, down the line when i think i i was 17 uh i was uh, maybe about a year later time is a little weird for me but um jeremy joined a hardcore band called reason for hate <laughs> and it was reason and it was you know was the whole idea was reason for hate hatred of you know racism you know sexism homo but you know what i mean yeah. it was all that kind of thing it was the yeah. beginning of that whole not the beginning it was an extension of that yeah. whole sort yeah. of Same. mindset yeah. yeah so uh so so he they needed a drummer and he called me and he asked me if i wanted to to try it out and so i did and and then just immediately started playing with him and you know all of a sudden realized that you know there was beats where i was gonna have to be like you know, like, you know, breakneck speed stuff and, you know, adjusted to that. But uh, it was an interesting thing for me to experience to go from like kind of a classic rock kid or whatever who was listening to, you know, a lot of, you know, I mean, you know, I, but I did listen to a lot of like No Means No at that point, which was, you know, a lot of that was pretty damn fast, even more so competently. But, uh, but uh, so I did that and then, there was a lot of other things that happened, but to bypass those to get to the sunny day aspect of it, <laughs> um, 
I was playing in several other bands and one of the bands, Positive Greed, um, we made a demo tape and it made its way over to Dan and Nate and they heard it. And so then all of a sudden they started coming over and hanging out at the house where I lived and they knew everybody else there, but I didn't really know those guys. I'd seen Nate play shows. I'd see Dan, I'd see, seen Dan at shows, but I hadn't really met those guys. So they just started coming over and all of a sudden hanging out, you know, bringing beer over and, and we were like, how come they're coming over every night? It's like, it was totally bizarre and random. <laughs> and then they started asking me to go for walks. So I was like, okay, sure. And so we went for a walk this one night and uh, Dan goes, so dude, <laughs> he goes, so we heard that demo tape you did. And I, and I was like, yeah, you like it? And he was like, yeah, I did. And he goes, uh, you should play drums with Nate and I. And I was like, <laughs> so I was, in, I was already in three bands. At that oh, point. So Positive Greed, The Igloo Sect, Reason for Hate. And so I was like, well, what's one more? Which was actually a lot. So, so I, I we started that band, and then slowly over time, you know, Reason for Hate broke up. Jeremy moved away to Spokane for a while. The Igloo Sect broke up, and um, and I I quit Positive Greed, and so I was just focusing on what we were, what Nate and Dan and I were doing. We had many different names. Well, for a while, we played a show under a diff each show under a different name, yeah. and you know, I mean, most of the shows. We're in basements and, you know, and, uh, you know, like at that point also, uh, there was a teen dance ordinance that happened. So all ages shows all of a sudden became illegal. It was kind of like footloose <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, <clears throat> so we, um, so we were kind of just stuck in the basement for a while and then Jeremy moved back and, you know, we had gone from, you know, being, um, one day I stopped breathing as far as the name of the band, Chewbacca Kaboom. Actually, that was before that. I know, this is really stupid, silly. They were just so literally te temporary <laughs> names. Everything was beautiful and nothing hurt, I think was one. And um, then finally we said, and Nate, Nate came up with this idea for Sunny Day Real Estate. And I was like, well, that's almost like the worst one yet. <laughs> <laughs> but he was like, he was like, it's the one. I was like, whatever. Okay, that's fine if you guys really want to do it. He was so hell bent on it. He was so dead set on that name. And um, I, I just, I was like, you know, it's, it's been ridiculous so far. Why, you know, why stop now? <laughs> you yeah. know, so as far as the names go. So, yeah. so uh, Jeremy, Jeremy moved back from Spokane, came over, started hanging out a bit. Dan, he was introduced to, the songs that jeremy would play and record by himself that were kind of like his little private secret thing mm -hmm. and dan was like whoa you know <laughs> and then jeremy started opening up for us we, like we had a show and another another show in a basement we had a show that we played in spokane opening up for lungfish which was really really oh that's amazing. awesome yeah yeah lungfish was phenomenal really big yeah. yeah yeah they were a huge influence on sunny day now you wouldn't not you wouldn't really hear it but just the soul screaming heartbeat skipping like relentless groove and overwhelming feeling that these were four men that were just men friends you know and they were just creating together mm -hmm. and they were just doing it you know because they needed to express something and yeah. uh it just was really overwhelmingly powerful when I first saw them. So, so then I started kind of bringing the idea up to Dan of, I was like, you know, even though we've written like 46 songs, <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe Jeremy, what do you think about Jeremy trying to sing for, for us? And he was like, no way. He was like, <laughs> he was like, no way. He was like, Sunny Day Real Estate is, is set. It's, it's, it is the way it is, you know, and you go, and, but then Nate left to go on tour in Europe with Christ on a crush. And Dan said, but <laughs> during that time, he said, well, Nate's gone. <clears throat> Why don't we use that time to do a little side project with Jeremy? And he said, I'll play bass as in Dan will play bass. Jeremy can sing and play guitar, you know, obviously mm -hmm. play drums. So, 
so we did that and we called it <laughs> God damn it. we called it thief steal me a peach <laughs> uh, yeah yeah so yeah you know another ridiculous that, thing so that stuck <laughs> that well that's uh, well just for the song yeah 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 well the, the it stuck it ended up being the name of the first seven inch that yeah. sunny day put out yeah so so we uh so then so we we did that we played two shows one at best alternative school in kirkland at like eight in the morning and i oh. i don't i don't i don't recommend anyone yeah. ever playing drums like that at eight in the morning it's like a shock to your system i <laughs> swore i could see like spirits floating around i was i was out of my mind it was not a very good idea but yeah. But we did it, and uh, and then we played a show at the Odd Fellows Hall uh, with Rain Like the Sound of Trains, which is a band that uh, with Pete Kramiak. He was in a band called uh, Verbal Assault, and then uh, uh, Dougie Bird, who was in a band called Beef Eater, and their drummer's name Josh, and I can't remember his last name. But um, and then also uh, Hush Harbor played with us, and that was John Atkins' band, who I first was playing with in high school yeah he had a band called hush harbor and uh and then chikung chikung a band called chikung so <laughs> so we played that show and then we were talking about it that's where we wrote the song song about an angel and also that the song called rodeo jones yep. were written by thief steal me a peach yep. and then there were several other songs that we were going to use and i saw i have some li a live video of that show that we okay. played back then and i was listening to the songs i was like wow we didn't use hardly any of these songs that's really interesting i was like i wonder why we ditched all these other songs it's kind of weird but but that's where we, were, where we wrote those songs we decided okay when nate gets back we'll present this idea to him so Nick is back and we're like, hey, told him the idea. And he was like, that's crazy. He was like, what are, you, what are you guys talking about? And so he sat down on the couch and we had to basically present him <laughs> with, with what we were doing to see if he was into the idea of essentially uh, completely throwing away a lot of stuff that we had written, like getting yeah. rid of literally like almost like I think it was 46 songs of memory. So it was a lot. Oh. And starting over oh, man. with just like these few songs with Jeremy singing. And so we we did it, we played, and he goes, Okay, all right, yeah. And so he went to bass, Dan grabbed a guitar, was playing second guitar, and then Nate was like, Can you show me how you did that Rodeo Jones thing? You know, and yeah. <laughs> on the bass. And so that's how that started. And I know that we kept Rodeo Jones and Song About an Angel, a bunch of the other ones we just ditched, and then songs we just were writing, then the rest we wrote as a band, Shadows. And and, uh, and Circles was a song that Jeremy actually had done by himself on his four track that we ended up bringing to the band. So, so things like that. And we spent, um, we, we, we wrote that song seven and I wonder, sometimes I wonder if we called it seven, because I think we must've spent about seven hours just staring at the, <laughs> staring at the ground in the room, trying to figuring it, trying to figure out how to bring that song to it's, you know, yeah, uh, to, to its close, like how to end it. You know, we were trying to figure out, we couldn't finish the arrangement. We got to a certain point we were stuck. We were literally for hours just staring at the ground, all of us thinking and not getting anywhere. <laughs> um, and I don't even remember how we ended up, you know, pulling it together.
How'd you guys get connected with Sub Pop Records? There was a total accident. Uh, it was just a total fluke. It was like, oh, yeah. uh, there was this band called Engine Kid, and they were they were going to play a show at the Crocodile Cafe in Seattle with another band called Skirt. And so the whole Seattle thing was blowing up then, like the, yeah. whatever you people, what people called the grudge thing, whatever you want to call it. So that was a big deal. And so us being from this punk rock scene that was so completely disconnected from that. And, you know, if you didn't already know someone or already kind of, you know, whatever, pretty much know someone, you could not get a show at any of the sort of more popular bars, venues, clubs in, in yeah. Seattle. So Nate would try to call and see if we could, you know, book a show there. And he would, they would just hang up on him constantly, just wouldn't even talk to him. So, so engine kid had somehow got a show at the crocodile. I'd actually like to know how they pulled that off and uh, they can't, they couldn't do it. So they canceled. They told Eric Soderstrom, the booking agent, they said, Hey, there's this band, Sandy real estate. You should put them on in our place. So we did. He saw us play and he came up to us and he said, you know, I'm going to do an experiment. He goes, I'm going to put you guys on the opening up for this sub pop party that's coming up here. And he goes, and I'm just going to see what happens. So we're like, okay. So, so we did, we, he did it and we played. And if memory serves, I know that there was one person standing in the room while we were playing. And I mean, literally all I could see was just one person and it was, Jonathan from Sub Pop, Eric must have gone up up to him and said something like, "Hey, you should watch this band." And uh, <laughs> so he he watched us play. We got done with the set, and he walked up and he said, "Hey, do you guys want to make a record?" And we started laughing at him. <laughs> we just, you know, we, we yeah. thought he was messing with us, and we didn't know who he was. We had no idea. Oh, man. So <laughs> so we were like, "How oh, very funny," you know. And he goes, "No, I'm I'm serious. I'm Jonathan from Sub Pop Records." And we we're like, "Oh." Oh, and he goes, so do you guys want to make a record? <laughs> and we were like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why not? So, so that's how that happened. It was just a total accident, you know, like, I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't know. It's just a weird thing, you know, yeah. just literally like a fluke, one fluke after another, you know? So it wasn't like something, you know, where, you know, it was just, we accidentally were, got in front of the face of the person who ended up being interested yeah. you know, ultimately yeah. eric soderstrom is to is to be thanked for yeah. you know making that happen but you know but ultimately it was an accident you know engine kid had to cancel and they were nice enough to suggest us so that's great but yeah sorry that, didn't that's mean to interrupt you. oh no it's okay no. <coughs> yeah, Eng engine kid they've just put all their stuff up on Bandcamp, and it's all really good mm -hmm. I'll, I'll plug them on the show they're really good yeah 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 <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I've known, I mean, Brian Kraft, Jay Devitt, Greg Anderson. I mean, we've all, I mean, they're all, they're all from the same scene as us, yeah. you know? Yeah, we're all from the same, like, greater sort of, like, punk rock family, yeah. you know? So, and Jade was from the Tri-Cities. Tri-Cities has this, you know, something about it where just these great musicians, great drummers, especially, come out of there. Um there's this thing that I call Legion and it's like all these, it's all these drummers <laughs> from, they're all from tri cities and they're just these heavy hitting, just monster drummers and, uh, and all really great guys. So, but, uh, but yeah, and Nate is from the tri cities, you know? So he was in diddly squat. So like Jade, you know, the drummer of engine kid, you know, like he grew up, you know, like listening to, you know, being into diddly squat as an inspiration for guys locally to get into playing in a band and go out and do it, you know? That's cool. So, yeah. So it's all interconnected. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and Greg Anderson uh, was in Brotherhood with uh, Nate as oh. well for yeah. a while. So, yeah. So, yeah. That's cool. But anyway. Uh, was there a point in those early days where you noticed uh, the emo attachment to the band? No. Uh, no. No. N no. Uh, <laughs> see, it was, I think it was after we got back together that all of a sudden that was that came that was brought to my attention and we were like we we're like what what we're like wait a minute what does that mean we're like wait because <laughs> um 
I, and I'm just telling you, like, so from my experience, uh, like say we were at a show and there was somebody who was going out of their way to bring a lot of attention to themselves and be like, you know, like super into it, freaking out, like in front of the band and sort of showcasing themselves. That was the first time I heard someone say, hey, look at that fucking emo guy over there. <laughs> and, uh, and that was the first time I heard that, that before. I was like emo. I was like, I'd never heard that before, but obviously it meant like this guy saying, look at me. I'm so whatever. I'm yeah. so like, uh, you know, into it, you know? And, um, and, and then at that time I didn't know what the origins were of that, but the yeah. origins, the origins being from an article, uh, regarding, uh, right to spring, I believe. Yeah, right. Yeah. DC. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I went from that to, which I didn't even know about and then found out about later. So, so, you know, I mean, uh, it, it is what it is. It, it's, um, I didn't really think of sunny day real estate's music as being something you could categorize or put into a box myself. Uh, I mean, ultimately it was a rock band, like in the sort of broadest sense of, yeah. you know, of the word, you know, it, it was loud, heavy, but they were songs with arrangements they told a story hmm. uh, for me it's more storytelling than anything else to be honest but uh but honest storytelling and uh and i think the idea that emo is is like emotional right emotional yeah. so to say that like emotionally driven music is a new thing is doesn't make sense because you know, emotion, human emotion has been the launching pad for art from since the beginning of the beginning. So, yeah. so, I mean, it is what it is. Like I said, I mean, people for whatever reason have a need to, to put something in a box and, you know, yeah, you know what I mean? So, and that's how that ended up happening. And it doesn't make sense to me, but it, it used to bother me. Now I, it doesn't bother me. Yeah. It's just, I don't care. You know, it's just like, anybody like on the surface that hasn't really listened to the band and it gets like with that category category you know placed in that category people maybe might you know disregard it or or maybe would be more likely to listen to it i just don't know but ultimately sunny Day real estate is just this thing you know that were just it was just songs it was storytelling you know it was just people you know experimenting with song arrangement <laughs> What was the catalyst for the uh, first reunion? Oh, Greg Williamson contacted me and was, they had had an idea to put out a sunny day real estate. They called it like a rarities record with like stuff on previously unreleased stuff. Mm -hmm. Then we, so we got together and we started meeting at Jeremy's house. Primarily it was just, um, Dan and I, and then I think Nate was coming over for a bit just to talk about that. And we were meeting and talking about it. And then Nate was, you know, gone on tour. And then we realized that, you know, we probably didn't quite have enough rare tracks or whatever for a full record. So then we decided that we would try to write a couple songs to record for it. Yeah. And so we went down to the basement, set up, and then just ended up writing the entire record <laughs> for how it feels to be something on. We're like, you know, screw well. Let's just forget the rarity rarities thing and make the record because yeah. we have a record. So, uh, so yeah, that's how how that came to be. Yeah, pretty much. We just we were gonna write a couple songs for this rarities thing and then just kept writing. So, and that that's that. awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. What was your contract just done with Sub Pop that you like your fulfillment was done and that's what led you guys to Time Bomb for the final record? Yeah, 
yeah yeah so the yeah so the how it feels was um the what we had a contractual obligation for one more record with them so yeah so then after that then it was like you know trying to figure out what where to go after that and yeah went to time bomb and that ended up being like a well it being exactly that yeah <laughs> it was like <a> time bomb <laughs> When you guys did your reunion tour in 2009, I caught the show in DC. You guys, at least at that stop, only played, uh, from what set list I can find online, what I remember, only uh, guitar and video games from the second half of the band's catalog. Was there a decision only to play early songs on that? Yeah, tour? yeah, yeah. It was, um, it was Nate basically coming back to because Nate wasn't involved in How It Feels or The Rising Tide. Yeah, and so. I know that there was a push to. I think I think Nate was Nate Nate was much more interested in just revisiting the stuff he played on. Yeah. So, um, that's why you know, and also I think there was another the other reason was when Sunny Day got back together we 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 kind of avoided all the older stuff and actually we're only playing like the newer stuff and would maybe play one or two older songs and then mm -hmm. slowly slowly started bringing in um older songs you know into the live sets for the rising tide tour especially we we added a few more songs well and also for how it feels as well we added a few more but um we we kind of ignored a lot of the older stuff so we decided to go and maybe play some of the older songs that we normally didn't that we normally just ignored so gotcha. but then ended up kind of ignoring all the newer stuff <laughs> you know when when you reformed and we're only playing the new stuff was part of that fueled by like the change in the way jeremy sang uh wait wait so, so when you when did the first uh, when you were doing how it feels and rising tide and touring and mostly playing oh. new songs was that because um, his vocal delivery changed over that time frame. Yeah, I don't know if that was. I think it was just not wanting to do it. Or no, well, I think a lot of us. I think all of us had kind of changed. I know I had changed my approach quite a, quite a bit. So had Jeremy and um, I was not. I, I I was trying to figure out how to revisit that stuff without sinking back into ba old habits. Uh, a little bit but at the same time my habits were still bad at that point too i was still not <laughs> still wasn't breathing and uh still too tense but was making a little bit of progress anyway but um yeah i think we just i think more it was not not being really ready to revisit who we were as people God. If that makes sense yeah it was like going back to sort of having to express someone who you were that you aren't really anymore so it was a tricky thing you know yeah. i think i could probably psychologically i feel like i would be much more um capable of being able to navigate that now but yeah but then i but then i i don't i just you know convinced myself i wasn't i guess but but it was it was a combination of things some of which I can't really remember, but I think we were also just more interested in what we were doing then, you know, more so than we were in the stuff we were doing. Let's talk about this new project, Assertion. You're about to release your first new music, from what I can tell, in almost 20 years. No, 10. 10? Well, oh, yeah. For, released, yes. Released, yes. 20 years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but yeah, so I was thinking 10 years because the last time I yeah, toured, I guess. Toured, but yeah. uh, 
but yeah, no, holy crap, man, uh, 20 years. Yeah, thing to yeah 2003 true. was the fire theft, so yeah, wow. almost 18 years, yeah. God, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it seems oh. like yesterday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, oh, it's weird. Um, yeah, no, that's it is. It's uh, I um, Sunny Day started working on a fifth record. Mm -hmm there was a decision made not to follow through on it i thought that was unfortunate <laughs> but um and then uh i was also making another record with my band raleigh banks and that our bass player had to move to guam our guitar player quit all this stuff happened and we so i had basically recorded songs um almost complete record for the uh raleigh banks record and then we tracked seven songs uh just basic tracks for the sunny day record mm -hmm. both ended up just have like it was like the rug getting pulled out from underneath you mm -hmm. and uh i felt kind of um disenchanted so it kind of led to me that and a few other things that are relatively unpleasant you know yeah. lots of people dying things like that led me to just kind of going into sort of self-imposed exile is the best way to put it and uh and so and yeah and so i just walked away from music and didn't even want to hear music actually oh, at all and uh so then what happened was is um justin Tominga through facebook who is and was in a band called uh pig snout with his kids <laughs> and uh blind guides with a guy named brian gorder uh he reached out to me justin did and basically said hey um you know i first started trying to figure out how to play drums by playing seven and he said i'm you know I'm, i just want to say you know he just wanted to express some appreciation for some things that i had done which was really nice and um then uh chanery uh being the mother of my children <laughs> uh she said you know you should uh check out he teaches music to children with um autism drums primarily and uh that really got my interest because uh our five-year-old son logan has uh, autism so that that really got my interest and so i was checking that out and then i saw I heard and saw saw a video they had made and heard pig snout and saw what this guy was doing sharing music that part of himself with his children and it just hit me like it hit me really hard i was like what am i doing you know it's like i've got, got these kids and i'm uh, they literally have no idea about this part of me you know so I realized that um, not sharing that part of myself with my children was essentially, you know, just short of a crime, pretty much. Mm. So, so then, uh, so then, so then I I contacted Justin. And I was like, man, um, you know, I really, you know, I just told him I really liked Pig Snout, and I went to see him, uh, Blind Guides, uh, he and Brian's other band play, and saw brian gorder play bass for the first time i was like oh man <laughs> that guy's a really great bass player so so then uh i went over to justin's house and ended up sitting in and playing drums second drums or you know backup drums obviously for, <laughs> for his daughter dahlia Tominga, and i just played with them and that was kind of my first time sitting down and and playing again and then justin started coming over here and bringing his uh his guitar and his amp and we just started playing and then just started writing songs and then just kept writing songs. And I was like, Hey, do you think Brian would be into coming over? <laughs> so then Brian started coming over and then Justin started bringing his mics. We kind of combined, you know, forces and gear to basically make it so we could start recording stuff here. And then have just started, just started writing and recording since then and just haven't stopped. We were playing shows, but then obviously, you know, yeah, every, so, everything stopped. <laughs> everything stopped. So, so what we did is, since everything stopped, we just kept working on the record, 
finished that record and then and then it was cool uh, um then we came in uh, to contact with john fraser from spartan records really liked him immediately we didn't like go and talk to a bunch of people we talked to him and he was like we were like seems like a good guy let's do it okay so <laughs> so so you know and uh you know I, we just wanted to be able to have the we just wanted to be able to get the record out there and you know and not get um you know have have done to us what is done to many artists by record labels yeah <laughs> so you know what i'm saying not so, um, got fucked in the, in the press yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah i have a long history of that so yeah <laughs> so um so yeah i uh so we since we couldn't play shows after the record was done or you know we were going to do a tour got canceled mm -hmm. so then we just we just kept writing and uh and kept recording so now we're about i'd say 70 percent done with the second record that's awesome so, yeah um, yeah it's cool so it's cool and then uh the songs uh the songwriting is evolving and 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 our approach to recording is evolving as well and so uh it's just a cool experience and then and, and justin comes out here every two weeks and his and he just stays here for four days and we just like go we just go go at it for four days and just like write record write record write record like that's pretty that's much awesome it. yeah and uh so yeah it's fun so it's a cool rhythm to be into so and i'm really i'm really excited about the first record i'm even more excited about the second record just because you know it seems to be evolving as well so it's cool yeah yeah is there something sonically i don't want to ignore the first record which is about to come out but is there something mm -hmm. sonically different about what you're writing on the second record or is it similar vein or um god it's, i'm trying to figure out how to find trying to find <laughs> words it i mean well okay so for we we got a new microphone that helped <laughs> but uh, so but um uh primarily also justin um everything that he learned through the process of uh, uh, mixing the first record mm -hmm. you know is now we're we're now starting out with him you know having that knowledge yeah. you know i can't take any credit for it you know we we work on mixes together but i work primarily like as a like a uh, with my ear as a compass the one yeah. i can hear out of anyway and so uh, but he's been doing all the heavy lifting you know as far as like engineering and uh so but the the songs are there's a there's a very there's a wider uh range dynamic range as far as like how heavy and how delicate it is it goes to very 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 heavy but not like viking in a pillow heavy i mean like you know i'm talking about like you know or more organically like you know yeah. like heavy uh yeah. and and uh and the two songs that are very very atmospheric and subdued and stay there oh, so that's cool. and uh so it's like woof, it just it's just it's a it, it's a more there are more dimensions to it and there are a lot of dimensions to that uh for the so there's a song on the first record called set fire okay. so and you'll you'll and so that's the very last song in the record so um if you hear that song you'll understand what i mean by the sort of dynamic range uh and so there's more of that and there's more songs <laughs> so i guess is the best way to put it it doesn't make any sense if you haven't heard the song <laughs> but um you know and uh but you know and the other interesting thing is um so we we've been you know we've been writing a bunch of songs together and then Ju justin started showing me these files he has on his computer one will say like 270 one will be like uh yeah 205 or something like that and i'm and their songs song ideas <laughs> so this one's got like 270 song ideas you know wow. and and he starts like opening up we start going through it and like and from his memory he's like you know and so there'll be these 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 like 
song ideas or even more than song ideas, more like, you know, basic, you know, first skeletons of, mm -hmm. and I'm like, so what do you want to do with these? You know? And he's like, well, these have always been kind of my private, you know, like, uh, I always felt a little bit self-conscious about these to put them out. And I was like, okay, well, as an objective ear, we should take these and bring them to life <laughs> because this is really, really incredible stuff. And, uh, it shouldn't just not be heard. Yeah. So this, these should be taken. We should arrange them and bring them to life and put them out into the world to, to, for other human beings to connect with it. It just should be done. And, uh, that is how that song set fire came to be. It was from one of those files. Oh, wow. And there's three, three songs from the next record that are from that. I think it is three or four. And, um, and they're, yeah, they're the more atmospheric subdued. And I'm like, you know, dude, I was like, you know, we're don't, we don't have to be, we can, we can do whatever we want. We yeah. don't have to be, you know, and don't, not everything has to be like crack the earth in half. You yeah. know, it's like it, some of it can be like, you know, um, uh, as delicate as a child, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, I, that's the human experience. So, I mean, why, why deprive ourselves and other people from authentic, like dynamic range of the human experience being, you know, done musically, it has yeah. to be done. So, and that's what I like to do. That's what I, that's why I do it. Yeah. you know is to basically like document humanity through music that's all i really want to do don't want to like just thought about like you know i mean granted you want to support your family but i mean yeah. thus far music has not come through on that angle so i'm not doing this for like you know to like make money i'm doing this because i because because i want it for my children to remember as well that's one of the other things mm -hmm. so you know what I mean? It's like you just, it, it's, you want to sort of leave a message, you know, in a bottle, you know, by way of yeah. music, you know, for not only them, but all people that yeah. are willing to hear it. Or hear it. That's, that's what you're doing. Thanks for listening to As the Story Grows. Our theme song was written and composed by the legendary Bob Nana. If you like what you hear, subscribe on iTunes and give the show a rating and review. If you'd like to support the show financially, click on the Patreon link at asthestorygrows.com. If you enjoyed this episode, share it on social media with your friends. Much appreciated, and thanks for listening. I never felt so young and alive as when I'm diving into a tomb. And now I'm learning as I listen along, and the wheels are turning, and I started a song. What good word and I'm gone? Oh, as the story grows.
Oh, 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 oh,